Okay, in this video, we're going to take a look at four basic principles that we use to build super efficient housing. You'll find that most houses won't include all of these principles, uh, but if a house doesn't include all four of these principles, uh, it won't be super efficient. We have the fabric of the building, we call this the building envelope. Now, all houses have a building envelope. Uh, doesn't require any insulation and if we put uh, if we put Kevin inside he'll be uh, relatively comfortable until it starts getting cold at night a building with no insulation or anything in it'll get cold really quickly it'll get hot really quickly the only protection that this type of structure will give you is protection from the wind but when we add insulation let's put the insulation on now we we um, solve a problem but we also create a problem the problem with insulation is let's colour some, let's do a bit more colouring. Outside's cold and inside is warm. What happens is cold air doesn't hold as much moisture as warm air. So the all the air outside has um, little moisture in it and all the air in the ins inside has uh, more moisture but because it's warm it can hold that moisture in suspension so it, it, you're not damp or anything as this air cools if we've got insulation it as you go through the insulation it'll get colder and colder and colder and what happens is like a, if you imagine a coke bottle uh, with a nice bunch of ice in it sat on a hot summer's day you where does that water come from that runs down the, the outside of the glass that comes from the air that it condensates on the cold on the glass on the cold glass because cold air doesn't hold as much moisture as warm air and the opposite happens if you have a very cold air and you warm it up it will want to draw moisture from its surroundings because it can hold more moisture so if you take cold air in a building and you warm it up it comes very dry and that can cause a problem in a building and if you take warm air and chill it down, it has to shed that moisture somewhere and that inevitably ends up as condensation. So what happens is uh, moisture can percolate because it's a, it's a gas, to, it's um, in, suspended in the air, can percolate through your um, insulation to the outside here and condensate, which makes the, the uh, join between the insulation and the envelope of the building damp. So you have to um, make allowances for that. Let me just do that now. So typically a way to do that would be to ventilate the space between the outside shell and the insulation. So you would have a vent out the top here and a vent in the inside so that this white space is ventilated so any moisture that comes through uh, from the inside space to the outside is allowed to evaporate away and doesn't um, condensate causing rot and damp and mold and things like that but the next one's an airtight envelope uh, most houses have various holes in them uh, holes and gaps and things like that and if you were to con uh, concentrate all the gaps in your building um, into a single place you would end up with a uh, between a four and a six inch hole in your building but it, it, but there'd be many on this side and many on this side many tiny ones so what happens is as the wind blows through uh, as the wind blows it comes in all the tiny holes on this side of your building uh, with fresh air and pushes out all the tiny holes on this side of the building uh, and brings fresh air into the building effectively. But it takes all of the heat of the building. So there's, there's little or no point in having really good insulation if you don't have an airtight envelope. Obviously, people say, well, if you've got an airtight envelope, you're going to suffocate. That's true. So what you need to do is not the answer is not to ventilate there, there if you've seen the um trickle vents on windows which allow a tiny bit and just enough air to breathe through the building the, the concept the modern way of doing it is absolute garbage because what you do is you seal your building as tight as it can to make it as efficient as possible 
then you install trickle vents in the windows that allow all the cold air to come through the windows through the window trickle vents and out another window trickle vent so what you what you're effectively achieving is all your warm air is getting evacuated outside so many times an hour so what they call that is the uh, air exchange per hour if you look at this the uh, minimum specs are on, on building regs you have to have a minimum air circulation per hour and this usually comes from the trickle vents in your windows in one side and out the other but it takes all the heat of your building with it uh, the fix for that is a heat exchanger ventilation system so you have no opening windows your building is completely 100 percent sealed from outside uh, but your um, heat exchanger if, uh, i've done a video on heat exchangers before I'll, I'll, I'll drop a link in the in the description but i don't think anybody understood it but basically what it does is you the evacuate uh, warm stale air from your building and you intake cold fresh air from outside and they pass each other very closely so that the pass the, one passes the other in your heat exchanger so the warm stale air warms up the cold fresh air and they can be up to 95 percent efficient so the cold air the warm air goes out is replaced by cold fresh air which is warmed by the warm air going out if you get my drift uh, so th those are incredibly efficient and you can circulate far more air than you can with trickle vents. Uh, the idea is that um, Barry here will be breathing damp air, farting and uh, cooking things. What you want is you want you want more exchanges per hour than the minimum. You want uh, two to four times the the amount of air exchange because it stops um, sick building syndrome lots of reasons to get rid of the old air in the building and replace it with new air but there's no good doing that without the heat exchanger so the the airtight envelope increases your efficiency but you must have the um heat exchange and ventilation system with it right the next one is size this is not a lot this is not what um, many people consider uh, efficiency because they think, well, why can't you just build um, any building any size you want? Uh, the fact is that if we were to scale this building up, uh, should we scale him down instead? Um, saves my... Yeah. If we scale him down, tiny, so Barry's tiny, uh, as you scale the building up, as you double, double the size of the building, um, we'll, we'll look at the thickness of this insulation has to be much much thicker because that has to scale up the uh, amount of material we use it uh, has to be scaled up so it costs you more material more insulation um, just for him to have a, a bit more headroom um, there are limits to how big you can build a building uh, once you go past it here's a couple of examples uh, let's look at wind load if uh, if you double the size of a building it doesn't double the wind load it quadruples it if you double the diameter of this dome it quadruples the volume inside so uh, this would cause a runaway effect of needing much more insulation thicker and thicker insulation um, much more heat initial heat to heat the building and if you imagine we're looking at um, removing the air from that building and replacing it you're removing a lot in a small building let's undo him back to his normal size in a small building you can remove that air through a heat exchanger bring it back in quickly and efficiently but on a much bigger building which if it are twice as big it's four times the volume requires four times the strength and you can see how this uh, if you go eight times it's 16 uh, as, as you get bigger it gets much more inefficient so size is something that not a lot of people consider now i'm not suggesting you build a tiny tiny house um but i would say if you've got the choice of having a massive house or just bringing it in a little bit every if you can reduce the size uh, by 30 percent and still live in it comfortably that's a massive saving in efficiencies so it's it's not a case of let's build tiny although i do like the tiny houses 
it's a case of bring your house down to the smallest that you feel uh, you, you need uh, and not go uh, big just for fashion's sake. Okay, finally, lifespan. Nobody considers lifespan uh, anymore. Houses are built um, with no consideration to lifespan. Uh, I reckon a lot of modern buildings will probably be fairly knackered in 50 or 60 years time and they're going to need a huge amount of investment um, to to maintain and uh, obviously the lack of efficiency and the cost in heating if you if you have a house that costs you 10 percent in heating over a period of 40 years that's an absolute fortune uh, so if you were to build a house let's look at the two extremes if you were to build a really crappy house um, you, you could probably build it, let's say, for £10,000. Some real junk uh, house that only lasts 10 years and it has to be replaced. Or you can build a house that lasts five or 600 years. A lot of the houses in England are, are um, two, 300 years old, no problem. Uh, Carlisle Castle is 1,000 years old. So if you sp what you have to do, the equation you have, is cost to build the house and the lifespan that it has in years. So if you have a, a typically a hundred thousand pound house, or it's probably more like a two hundred thousand pound house now, it will not last a hundred years. Modern houses will not last a hundred years. Uh, they're going to need so much work done um, that the the cost is continually increasing. So let's take a house that uh, is made from um, something impermeable, like plate steel or something that can last. A thousand years it's going to cost you 10 times the amount to build it but it'll far out outweigh any uh, house that lasts 30 or 40 years okay let's leave it there then um what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a series and we'll look m more detail uh with each of these four topics starting with insulation of course thanks for watching and uh, we'll catch you in the next one